Hello and welcome. My name is Sarah Russell and I welcome you here today for this very special patient summit to celebrate World Ostomy Day. Before I go any further, I just want to share with you how to access the correct language uh, translation that you may need. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll be able to click on the globe icon and choose the language that you need. And this is also available in um, on a mobile phone, if you're on a mobile device, you can access that, that there as well. So we will be taking questions at the end of this um, webinar today. So if please put them in the Q&A section of the chat below. So every three years, ostomy organisations around the world celebrate World Ostomy Day. And October the 2nd will be the 10th time that this special event is taking place. This year's motto is Ostomates rights are human rights, anytime and anywhere. Convertech have asked me to celebrate World Ostomy Day by bringing together some very special people from around the world. We truly have a global summit for you today. So I'll start by introducing myself, tell you a bit about my background, and then I'm going to introduce you to our panel today. So I am Sarah Russell. I am from the UK. I'm a clinical exercise specialist, clinical Pilates teacher and cancer rehabilitation specialist. I'm the author of the Bowel Cancer Recovery Toolkit and the global exercise specialist for Convertech. I've had an ostomy for 11 years and it was formed as an emergency due to perforated diverticular disease, which came as a huge surprise and shock to me at the time. I'm a mother of two grown up boys. I love dogs, outdoor adventures, hiking, cycling, running, and I've completed over 38 marathons. But my real passion is about rehabilitation after ostomy surgery and helping people feel confident in their bodies and to get their lives back. So next up is our panelist, Faisal Jacobs from South Africa. Faisal is a motivational speaker, and when you hear him talking soon, you'll see how inspiring and motivational he is. He's a colorectal cancer survivor, and he's a proud ostomate since May 2016. He's the chairman of the South African Society Ostomates, known as SAS. He's a father and a husband, and he's a proud ostomate and advocate for ostomy rights. And our third and final panelist today is Jan Thorkelsen from Iceland. Jan is an accountant with KPNG, but more importantly, he's the president of the European Ostomy Association. He's the chairman of the Icelandic Association for Ostomates, and he's had his ostomy since 1995 as a result of ulcerative colitis. He's a husband and a father to three grown children. So let's get started. So what I'd like to do, first of all, is just show you this really inspirational video that we have created to show you today. This is my life now. <laughs> this is my life now. Come on, Maximilian! And it is going to be amazing. <laughs> This is my life now. This is my life now. This is my life. This is my life now. This is my life now. We can do, be, and live our life to the fullest. She is just having a blast swimming right now with her ostomy. I never thought I'd be my normal self. Turns out I'm a better version of myself. This is my life now. I feel so much more powerful in my day to day of what I can do. Spending a lot of quality time with my loved ones. This is my life now. We're healthy mom. I'm very, very, very grateful for it. This is my life. Healthy mom. This is my life with healthy mom. This is my life with healthy mom. And my healthy. We believe that when you have a healthy bond with your stoma, you have a healthy bond to life.
So isn't that great? I love that. Um, that theme, this is my life now. And I think we can all relate to that, um, particularly to the guy in the bed at the start of that video. And I know when I first had my stoma surgery, I lay in hospital and I looked down at my bag and for me, it was an emergency. And I thought, is this it? Is this my life? What, what does this even mean? How is this gonna impact the things I love doing? And what I've realized over the years is it doesn't have to impact my life if I don't let it. Um, but of course we know there are many challenges living with a stoma. Um, and I really want to get into that today and discuss that. And a lot of people don't feel like, you know, they're very happy with their stoma. So we want to address that, but I also want to look at some of the positives and how we can turn those negatives into positives. Um, and so, and knowing our patient rights, I think is incredibly important part of that process. Um, knowing our rights and not knowing that this charter of patient rights can help us feel empowered and in control. And it can turn something that we feel not very happy about into something maybe a little bit more positive that we can, can manage. So um, first of all, I just want to find out a little bit about your journey to having a stoma. So um, Faisal, if I can just start with you, if you can just tell me about how you got a stoma. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, hello to everybody from South Africa. Um, so my journey with my stoma started back in May of 2016. Um, I thought I had hemorrhoids and it turned out um, that it was uh, a cancerous growth. And on the 23rd of May, I received what I call my gift, um, Dolce & Cabana. That's the name I've given my stoma. Um, uh, 2016. Um, and the beginning was very challenging. Um, as, as part of that grief process, I wanted to give back. Um, that was part of the negotiation phase of, 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 of this whole cycle that I went through. And I started preparing to run a marathon as a cancer survivor, um, raising funds for a pediatric uh, oncology hospital being built. And that's where I started facing the real challenges of living with a bag, um, the <clears> leaks, uh, and so on. And seeing that there wasn't a lot of support available uh, um, at the time. And I just took it upon myself to make a change, um, take charge of the situation, um, my situation as best as I could. And along the way, I started seeing other people needing help. And yeah, we formed SAS. So you take, you've taken your personal situation and, and your experience of having colorectal cancer, which wasn't actually that long ago. It's only, what, six years, five years ago, six years ago? Five so years. You've, five years. Five years, sir. And, and so since then, you've done a huge amount. Um, so Jan, tell, tell us about your journey to having stoma surgery, because that sort of sounds like it was very different for you. Yeah, I, I've never got, gotten cancer so far, but in 1982 or 1983, when I was 22 or 30, 23 years old, I got sick with with the colitis ulcerosa or IPD disease. And I was fighting that for 12 or 13 years until both myself and the doctors gave up in the autumn of 95 and I had my first operation. And I can really relate to the guy that started the video being lying in bed and feel, feeling helpless. I, I, I still remember this, waking up after the first operation and then putting my hand down on my, on my abdomen and feeling the back and almost feeling, oh shit, this is the end. Mm. But uh, there are many years since and I've had, uh, I think, seven operations in all. I've had two kinds of stoma, both a J pouch and an old-fashioned ileostoma, as I sometimes say, and I, I'm having ileostoma now for the rest of my life. Uh, I've had one bad operation, which had to be repeated, so 44 hours after it happened. I don't re recommend that to anyone, it's, it's a very difficult process. <laughs> but uh, I've come to terms with having a stoma. This is just my life, and life is good and has been good for quite a while. So you can live with a stoma if you if you really try it. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And and I think just what you were saying there about the, the man in the video at the very beginning, 
that really made me feel quite emotional because I, I can still relate to that feeling as well. I'm sure anybody that wakes up in a hospital bed, whether it was a planned ostomy surgery or not, has that feeling of, is this it? And, you know, mine, mine was formed as an emergency. I was perfectly well and healthy. My colon decided to perforate one day, <laughs> which is not to be recommended. And uh, I woke up with an ostomy. I'd never even heard of an ostomy. I didn't know anyone who had one. So I'm Googling you know, on my phone, what on earth, what on earth is this? Um, and yeah, like you guys, you know, you, you think, is this it? And I came home from hospital and thought I would be disabled and that I would never run again. And yeah. that's not the case. Jan, yeah. what do you want to say? Yeah. Well, there wasn't a Mr. Kukul in, in 95 when I was having my first, <laughs> first operation. But I had a lot of luck with the Icelandic Ostomy Association at the time. They sent me a, a guy to do a supportive interview with me. And he visited me at the hospital. It was during winter. And he made sure to come to the, to the interview wearing his ski outfit. He was just in from the mountains. And this wow. showed me that everything could be done. It was very, it really saved my life. There's, there's no, no hiding that. And that I think so, that such can, a lovely story. Yeah, I, I really like, like it. And it, like yeah. I said, it really saved my life. And do you time. still have contact with him now? Are you? Is he still around? Do you, he, do you know he, him? Sadly, sadly, he died a few years ago, but we, we met regularly on meetings. He was a regular comer to our meetings. And it was always nice to meet him. Yeah, it's really important to have that role model, I think, as well, when, when you, and just something to aspire to, to know that you're going to be okay and what is going to be possible. Um, yes. You know, like you, I found on Google, unfortunately, this man didn't come to my hospital bedside, but I found on Google um, a mountaineer, Rob Hill, who's a Canadian uh, mountaineer, and he'd climbed Mount Everest. And that still is very clear in my mind. I found him first thing on a Google search, and I thought, oh, well, if you can climb Mount Everest when you have an ostomy, yeah. I'm pretty sure I can go for a run. And, but, but there's still a huge gap, and we'll get to that in a moment about rehabilitation. And, and, but let's yeah. talk a little bit about um, the theme of, of this today, which is very much talking about our patient rights and kind of World Ostomy Day, which, which is um, the 2nd of October, which is tomorrow. But, but Jan, you're the president of the European Ostomy Association, and the European Ostomy Association has come up with this theme for today. So can you tell me a little bit about the history behind World Ostomy Day? Um, well, the World Ostomy Day, or, or what for short, was first celebrated in 1993 after being in, invented in sort of way by Gerhard Engler, who was president of IOA, or the International Ostomy Association at the time. It was thought to be a necessary tool to fight, fight for uh, basic rights in the, in the in order to make life better for ostomates, we, we didn't have a, a lot of things going for us then. And ever since this happened, it's been thought of as a vital way of thinking. And uh, it helps us to, to fight for, osto for appliances and, and good care in the hospitals. But it also helps us to fight stigma and prejudice, which is very very high in some countries. Uh, that, that's that's the main issue of, of the World Ostomy Day. To bring light yeah, to uh, the we'll, light of ostomates. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment because the, the theme of today is, is really quite strong. It's this ostomates rights are human rights. And can you tell us about why that was chosen? Well, my EOA EC team or, or the board of EOA was given the job of choosing a theme for this year's what and we had a lot of thoughts and we looked at older themes and and when you when you're doing a theme like this it's it's not enough to find something that sounds right you have to be able to believe in it and you have to be able to mm. sort of fight for it and I really didn't like this theme at all. We had, what, seven or eight themes that we had invented to choose from. And 
the others liked this team and uh, I lost the final election, but ever since that, then this team has been growing uh, and I think it is a very good team. So I'm, I'm really proud of having lost that election, if I may say so. You, you, don't, you couldn't hear a politician say this, but, but I really like this. <laughs> I like that. Faisal, what are your thoughts on, on World Ostomy Day and, and this theme and, and what that means to you? Uh, I think, I mean, firstly, World Ostomy Day, it's, it's, a, it's a very necessary platform um, for, mm. for us to create the sort of lack of awareness that is, that is around there. Uh, personally, I would, I, I would love to see it more often than just every uh, three years um, because of the lack. Um, uh, as you mentioned, you didn't know what a, what a stoma was. Um, mm. Neither did I, and and so many people. And when I get introduced to people, and what is a stoma, and then it's wow, um, and then that prejudice comes in, and people keeping distance. Mm. So we need to 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 lift that game around the education around uh, around this, and particularly the stigma. The theme, I'm so thankful that you lost that election, uh, Jan. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, again, and, and, and I think it ties in with the lack of education that's over there, is in, in, in some instances, and I'm going to speak particularly here in South Africa, the lack of medical care, uh, almost, and, and almost basic medical care that is, that is not happening. Um, we need to educate our, our ostomates, our ostomy community, um, about their rights and, and their right to a dignified life, they, their right to this new life uh, that they have. Mm. I think that's, that's so important. And I think, you know, we all live in different countries. We all have very, very different experiences. And everyone watching this, um, whether people are watching it live or on replay, are going to have very different experiences as well. Here in the UK, I consider myself to be incredibly fortunate. And when we've been preparing for this today and listening to some of the stories um, from other countries makes me feel incredibly fortunate and privileged to have access to the supplies that any supplies that I need, I have choice of products. And I know that's not the case in many other countries. So, yeah. you know, I think in the UK, we're, we're very, very fortunate. And we have, of course, we have the NHS to pay for our supplies as well. So we're, we're a very, very fortunate place, um, but it's given me a different perspective and the difficulties and challenges. Yeah, Faisal. So, I mean, it's, uh, again, I, I, we, I, I've spoken to a lady about two weeks ago. Um, she was speaking on behalf of her husband and, and they were desperate. They were reaching out for help. And she said her words were six months ago, the doctor said to me, this surgery is going to change your life. Six months later, we're battling for bags. This changed my life in the wow. most horrendous of ways. This is not life. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, and this is why we need days like this. This is why we need to, to raise this topic. Yeah, I think, you know, we need to do a number of things. We need to raise awareness of what stoma is, the conditions that lead to the requirement of a stoma, because we all three of us have got different conditions um, but also about our rights as ostomates about the right to go to a swimming pool about the right when we're traveling through an airport and we want you know the, the airport um, security guys want to pat us down when we're going through the control or that just pure access to bags and products that we need and basic care um, Jan, this is obviously, you know, in your role as um, as president of the European Ostomy Association, you know, this is incredibly important to you. Um, why, why is that? Well, <clears throat> we're living in the year 2021 and we can put a man on the moon and we can go as deep in the ocean as the ocean is deep. But uh, in many places of the world, Healthcare mm -hmm. systems do not provide ostomates mm -hmm. with appliances and diligent care. Why, why is this? You have to, if you, keep, I know people are getting operated and sent out of the hospitals and, and are not provided with anything, not mental health care and appliances. Why is this happening? And some people would say that this would on, only be happening in third world countries with low, very low national income, but that isn't correct. 
This is happening in Europe as well. This has to this has to stop. This is intolerable in, in any way you look at it. So we have to keep on fighting and uh, provide the right atmosphere for Ostomates to stand up and, and demand yeah. better service. I think so. I, I agree. Agree a hundred percent. And whether that's demanding the most basic requirement of product and a bag and the amount that you actually need to manage your mm. ostomy, because that is going to be different for everyone, or whether it's demanding physiotherapy or rehabilitation to get back to an active job or whatever in each individual needs, we have to be strong enough to say, this is not okay. I need this to be put in place for mm. me, wherever we live in the world. Faisal, yeah. you, you've had some experience that you were sharing earlier in the week. Can you tell us a little bit about, I think it was about in Zimbabwe, you were talking about what's happening there. Um, yeah, so patients in Zimbabwe, um, they're not even getting bags from from, from the hospitals and, and uh, Jan will know a lot more about that. Um, they rely on an organization called ILCA who are dependent on getting donations for bags to be able to do, uh, to give patients or ostomates the ability to live a dignified life. Um, so the biggest question we should be asking is why are you having those surgeries if you cannot support the patient, if you cannot support the life? Mm. Jan? Yeah, the situation in Zimbabwe is an example of a horrible situation. People get operated there, like Faisal said, and don't get any appliances. But uh, the ILCO organization that he is talking about is the Swedish Ostomy Association. They started working there in 2011 and have been sending appliances as much as they can. We've also sent them occasionally appliances from here and they are getting shipments from friends of, of, of Ostomates worldwide, which is an American and the Canadian organizations which are very helpful in many ways in, in these aspects. But there is also one, one view that you can take on this uh, ostomy or having problems in the waste disposal systems of the body is not a sexy thing. Mm. Everybody can relate to somebody's having cancer, especially breast cancer, if you have a tumor in your head that's easily to be talked about. But when you start talking about these kind of problems, getting rid of, of, of waste from your body, people shudder and, and, and mm -hmm. don't talk about it. It's, it's a taboo. That is a big part of the problem. I'm sorry to say. I it, thought that was just the, I thought that was just the British being very prudish, <laughs> but clearly not. It's, it's around the world, yeah. isn't it? You know, it's a worldwide I, problem. I was, a worldwide problem and we need to change that we need to be okay to start to talk about poo yes. and waste yeah Faisal it's, it's 100 percent um I've mentioned this so many times before if you take 30 30 years ago um the AIDS pandemic um people shied away from it but what changed the mindset was the education that came along with it um the talk about getting the right course of treatment um, educating the patient on how to take that treatment. The whole, the whole scenario changed. Uh, it, it's almost become acceptable. Oh, you've got AIDS. It's no longer a case of you, 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 you're moving away. You're taking 10 steps back. Um, I was chatting to a lady not too long ago. She had a surgery. She's moving about and she goes to her opposite neighbor, um, for a chat. And the neighbor was obviously asking about the surgery and she told her what it is and when she got up to leave the neighbor took a cloth and wiped down the seat that she was sitting with and that's yeah yeah we need to change that <laughs> oh this that makes me feel horrible. so sad mm. yeah this is horrible yeah yeah that's not okay i mean you know i i feel very fortunate i've never experienced stigma like that and and a, a friend of mine who's a counselor who's actually going to be talking in the second session today she she talks about as as someone with a stoma what we have to project is a positivity and we have to project how 
we want to be respected and responded to as well. So we have to advocate for ourselves. And if we are saying, oh, it smells or I'm worried about it, that reflects a little bit. So we have to start being positive around our situation as well and not allow those right. things to happen and, and question them when they do. Yeah. Um, so Jan, you know, obviously we've been going through the pandemic over the last 18 months or so. And tell us a little bit more about sort of how we can help each other moving forwards. Well, it's clear that when we are having a pandemic like this COVID-19 thing, all, all sources within the healthcare system are, are targeted at, mm. at destroying that problem. So there is less left for other diseases and, and an unsexy disease like having a stoma gets uh, tucked somewhere uh, in the back. Uh, many things are treated before that. But, mm. uh, for example, I recently, but there are more problems. Some of them are bad and some of them are perhaps luxury problems. I recently read an article in a newsletter that is put out every two months by a big and old organization here in Europe in a country that is supposed to set standards for treatment of patients. And the chairman there, he was complaining about having to take a fight with the health authorities one more time. Because in that country, depending on where you live, you only get one kind of appliances. Hmm. Not everybody can use the same appliances. What if it doesn't fit your body? There is a... I use a certain kind and uh, another big kind I simply cannot use because the glue that is used on the, on the appliances doesn't fit my skin. I get sore from it. People don't seem to look into those things uh, very carefully. But so having a, no appliances at all or having not the correct appliances, what kind of a problem is this? Is this tough shit or is this a luxury problem? But mm. in the end, we would like to say that we have human rights and we expect them to be honored. Mm. Uh, that is very clear. And uh, that's why we need to use the world ostomy day to the fullest, to fight for our rights and clear out uh, prejudices and stigma as fast as we can. It's, it's no way around that. We, we need to be yeah. seen and heard worldwide. Yeah. And the, the, the charter of ostomates rights that your association mm -hmm. has um, produced is really just a list of, of some very key bullet points. Um, of things that the most the most basic kind of expectation but you know we can start to use this list which is available on your website on the european ostomy association website and i think there's a link to that in the chat if anyone wants to access it okay. but you know this list is is really important and this we need to be sharing with our healthcare mm. professionals with our friends colleagues in the workplace to say you know these things um you know, I'll give you an example of something that is, is, is on the list. To have a well-constructed stoma placed at an appropriate site and with full and proper consideration to the comfort of the patient. Now, I see patients that have had stomas formed and they've just been put in the groin or they've been put really high up on the abdomen. And, you know, those and the stoma may be very, very small or very flush. So the bag doesn't fit very well. They're getting a lot of leakage. It makes their clothing choice difficult. It makes it impossible to even do their job if, if they have to wear a, a certain uniform. But where that stoma is positioned and how that stoma is formed is essential. Yes. Um, and some of the conversations we have in the UK with the surgeons is the surgeons will often do the surgery and then they'll leave it to a less qualified surgeon to create the stoma, which is almost the finishing up part of the surgery, but actually that's the most important part of the surgery because that's going to impact your quality of life for the rest of your life, how well that stoma is formed. Um, but, you know, one of the other things on your, on your brilliant list is having unrestricted access to a variety of affordable ostomy products. And that's a basic right and we yeah. need to be using this list and talking to everyone about it, I think. Yeah. Um, Faisal, what, what are your views on this charter of ostomates rights? I, th I think it, it, it is brilliant. And 
you know, if you look at the list, the full list itself, it's there's no unreasonable requests on there. Um, it's it's all down to just the basic, almost bare essentials of what we need in our new life. And sadly, um, it's not being honoured. And, and it's up to organisations such as SAS, such as the European Union, um, uh, ostomy associations across the globe, to advocate that healthcare professionals, um, the medical fraternity, uh, the, uh, are held accountable if this list is not honoured. Because that, I think that's the important thing. And it all starts with us as the patient to speak up, to make ourselves aware of what this list is and say, listen, I'm supposed to get um, affordable appliances. I'm supposed to get enough appliances. Instead of having us bucketed in a list that says, you know, this bag, the supplier says you can wear for up to seven days. That's in a bubble. But, you know, as, as you would know, Seda, you go on a long run, you work in a, in a sweaty environment that's hot, that bag degrades, your wear time drops. Um, so different things or different environments impact us differently. And, and, and Jan also mentioned adhesive. Um, you know, it works for some and it causes a skin irritation for others. And the skin irritation brings along another lot of problems. Mm. So it starts with the patient. It starts with the patient speaking yeah. up, being, being aware of what his or her rights are. Yeah, I think that's that's really true. And I, th I think certainly for me, when I went through my surgery, I I very, you know, I was young, I, I'd previously been fit and active, and I was a runner. And I thought, I'm not going to be able to do any of these things again. I found my mountaineering friend who climbed Mount Everest. But then how do I get from lying in hospital, just having had this major surgery to doing the things I want to do, there needs to be a a step-by-step -step process to get there and that's one of the things I've been really passionate about developing over the last decade is focusing on the rehabilitation aspect which we could add to your list of rights I think there um, Jan you know to yeah. expect basic rehabilitation and and you know and and exercise therapy um, after surgery to, to get people back to not not just running marathons but back to lifting their children or being able to pick up a shopping bag Faisal. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, we, we had a discussion uh, previously where one of the things my surgeon told me, be be really be careful of developing a hernia. And that sat and that created such anxiety. When I prepared for my first marathon, I completely avoided the core workout, completely avoided it because I was afraid of developing this hernia. Um, and as you say, if you are given, if you are taken through a process um, to to start engaging that core again, to start bracing yourself, breathing, uh, um, as 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 you showed, um, as is so important. And yes, it's not just about going to run up a mountain or or running a marathon. It's about picking up your grandchild, picking up your son mm -hmm. or your daughter, um, your basic day to day living, um, and. You know, if we can just look at the statistics available about people who've developed a stoma, a, a, a hernia, um, because of the lack of that rehabilitation, how much money would mm -hmm. we save from, from, from the medical fraternity side? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's something I'm I'm very, very passionate about here in the UK and, and the work I've been doing with Convertec to develop a rehab program and also with my online fitness classes that I teach for people with stomas and you're right it, it, and I, I've spoken to two young men in the last couple of weeks in their 20s and 30s and that seed of fear be very careful don't lift you know um, it, it's mm. actually quite a damaging message because what that does then people are scared to do anything and they never reach their, their true potential because they haven't done the rehab because this fear mm. seed of fear is in their head and these guys that I've spoken to are, one is terrified to pick up his baby son. So his wife was doing all the childcare, she was doing everything it's three months after his surgery because he'd been told not to lift. And okay, that's important to a degree at the beginning, but we need better advice than that. Jan, have you got thoughts on that? <clears throat> yeah, about rehabilitation. When the 
Charter of Ostomates Rights was composed in the early 90s, rehabilitation wasn't as big a thing as it is today. Hmm. I've been exercising in some way all, all the time since I've been 12 or 13 years old. I've played football and basketball and whatever and been, out, been an outdoors person. I, I, I ran for, a, for many, many years now and bicycling mostly. But, uh, and today we have research that has lasted 20 years and the doctors are saying exercise, keep fit, that will help you through any, any mm. type of bad health and it will also help you fight your old age. So there is no way escaping it. We should uh, move and exercise in, in some way. I sometimes say when people say, oh, I can't do that, it's too difficult. And I sometimes say, take the cat out for a walk. That's a good start. If you can't do anything else, take the cat out and, and uh, see what happens if you are uh, active on that. I think this is really necessary for people to take into account, to exercise and keep fit mm -hmm. as possible. There's a big awakening here in, in Iceland about uh, people getting 65 years old or something like that to put them in rehearsal programs and, and to help them stay fit. I think that really helps yeah. in any situation. Yeah. I mean, as, as an exercise specialist, you know, that's what I've done for my, for 30 years of my career. And to, you know, we know that exercise is a form of, of medicine in a way, because it keeps us fit, it keeps us active, keeps our muscles strong. And we're not talking about running marathons, we're just talking about basic physical activity and movement and maintaining yeah. muscle mass. The work I do with my cancer patients, um, and I work with palliative cancer patients who are in the last year of their life, and we we use exercise with them, and it's incredibly powerful, and it improves their quality of life, it lengthens their life, so it has a role everywhere. The problem that I see is when someone has an ostomy and they're told to be careful not to lift and not to exercise or not to do core exercises. They then don't do anything at all. And, and research that we did with Convitec showed that something like 80% of people with an ostomy had decreased their physical activity levels and they weren't exercising at all. So, you know, we, we need to change that completely because it, we need to live well with our ostomy as well as we can for the rest of our lives. So Have we're going to take questions. Yeah. So go on. Uh, you always have to start carefully after an operation like o ostomy operation, but once yeah. you've started and uh, increased your workload slowly, you, you can get to a point where you, what you wouldn't believe before yeah. you, um, yeah, I think that is very necessary just to start yeah. slowly, work carefully, and then you'll get there in the end. There's no question about I, I that. Always, in I always um, describe it to people as saying, you know, we, we've got, um, it, it's finding the balance between not being scared, but still respecting your stoma and still respecting yes. the surgery that you've had and we're exercising in a way which finds that sweet spot between those two points, because just do what you want isn't right either. Um, before we go into uh, sort of questions, there's quite a few questions that have sort of popped in. Um, I just want to just get from you both um, kind of your key piece of advice that you'd want to give to uh, someone who's having ostomy surgery right now, but maybe in relation to these rights. Um, Faisal, what would your advice be to a new ostomer? Uh, <clears throat> um, as, I, as I said before, um, make yourself aware of what this charter of, of, of rights is all about. Know what your rights are and don't be afraid to speak up. Um, the, the other thing that I would like to share with, with a patient e or an ostomate is don't just go to the Googles and the online support platforms. Um, the medical advice that gets shared there can be dangerous. Um, everyone is unique. Everybody's situation is unique. One of the challenges that an ostomate may, may find um, is this thing called a blockage. And when you have people dispensing medication online um, without the qualifications, without knowing what your medical history is, that's risky. 
Your journey is your journey. There are similarities, but there's also predominantly the individual aspect of it. It's about you. There is no rules, Royce, of bags, because that's a question I get often. What is the best bag for me to use? It's dependent. There, there is no rules, Royce, of bags. There is no rules, Royce, of suppliers. Um, it is about you, the individual, your body type, your skin type, um, adhesive, working, not working. Um, but most important, don't be afraid to speak up. Don't be afraid. And if you are, if you find you're not getting that joy, we reach out to the Ostomy Association in your area. Reach out to the support groups. Find someone that can uh, can help you. Because the more we speak up, the more we we say, no, this is unacceptable. We are not going to stand for this. The more we're going to get hurt. Mm. I, I agree 100%. And, and I think there's, there's very much of don't accept anything. If, if your bag isn't working or it's not fitting or it's not sticking or you're getting yeah. leaks or you're getting odour, don't accept that as normal. Look for a solution. Look for something different if you can and, and advocate for that and keep trying. Okay. Um, uh, uh, just, yeah, so uh, an example is I went to a... I was seeing a stone in us and I changed. Um, you know, running, especially in, 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 in summer here in South Africa, it can get hot. And the bag was actually disintegrating. When I had to remove it, there were pieces of the base sticking to my finger. And when I said this to the stoma nurse, she says to me, yeah, it's hot, it's humid, these things happen. You, we just got to deal with it. No, <laughs> no, that's, that's unacceptable. <laughs> And I, I, I spoke up, she wasn't able to help me and I went elsewhere and, and I got the help that I needed. Today I can run for three hours and not have to worry about finding a toilet to change my bag. The bag sticks, the bag holds, and it gives me that confidence. Yeah, and I think without doing that research or finding the bag that works for you, you then feel like you're not in control, you're, you're limiting your life and you can't, do you know yeah. for you it was it was running but for somebody else it might be as simple as actually leaving the house or going yeah. for a meal with their friends or going back to work and going back to work might mean you know the financial security of their family so it's really important i think to yeah absolutely don't don't be shy and make sure you speak up and demand your rights and demand the things that you need to live your life Jan, what would your advice be to a new Ostomer, particularly in relation to the Charter of Rights? Well, <clears throat> if you wake up like the guy in the video that started this show, my, my advice would be don't panic. If you need, mm -hmm. take a deep breath, grind your teeth and say something ugly, but don't panic. You will have problems, you will have difficulties, but with a small kind, with a little bit of thinking and planning, you will go through it. And I would like to iterate what Faisal said. Don't do anything through the computer. Find yourself an organization, most of the organization in your area, and try to go there to get a supportive interview. Saved my mental health in 1995. I, if I hadn't gotten that interview. I wouldn't be sitting here having these talks today. That's, that's mm. for sure. Just don't panic, plan things, fight for your rights. And if there isn't an organization in your neighborhood, help to find found one and support it through. It will take a lot of time, but in the end, it will pay off. I'm quite sure of that. So yeah, this would be my I advice. I love that. Thank you. I love that. So just don't panic, a kind of, allowing acceptance to come to you rather than push and you go at your own pace with your recovery um yeah. i think that's really important yeah i think for me what's important with these rights is, is you know I, I i echo what what faisal says about not not accepting anything whether that's the product that isn't right for you or whether that's the swimming pool person who won't let you into the swimming pool okay. because They've seen you have an ostomy and, you know, those sorts of things aren't okay. But a lot of that comes from lack of education. 
when you're passing yeah. through security at the airport, a lot of it is actually lack of education of the security guard. They're not always trying to be unpleasant or awkward or difficult. They have a job to do, but they, they just don't understand what ostomies are. And we have to educate people and the associations around the world can support that education. And, and what days like World Ostomy Day will help to do that. Um, you know, it, it's not always, I don't always like talking about my ostomy, but I always come back to how important it is to raise awareness and how important it is for other people to understand what it is. Um, I was, I did a, a 50 mile ultra a few weeks ago and everyone was posting pictures of their kit bags online with all their electrolyte drinks and their extra spare socks and their things they were putting into their bags. And I posted a photo of my kit bag with a spare ostomy bag on top saying, has anyone else got one of these? But this is the most important thing that's in my kit bag. Um, you know, and actually for someone else to think, hang on a minute, this woman is doing a 50 mile ultra with an ostomy. It kind of, it, it raised awareness. And I was really nervous about posting that photograph. I'm not very big on social media like that, but it was really important. I had so many people reach out to me to say, I'm facing that surgery soon. I haven't been running. That's so important. I know I can do these things. And um, I felt really pleased that I'd actually done that. So whatever it is, wherever you are in your life, I think it's important to share uh, a little bit of education around what having an ostomy means, um, some of the challenges we face, but also some of the positive parts of our lives as well. So we've got um, sort of 13 minutes left of this chat today, and I just want to go through some of the questions that are coming through in the chat. If we can just address those um, as a panel. Um, so th th there's a, a, a chap here has asked a question, um, a, a very basic question actually, that we get all the time. Um, what is the advice avoiding leaks and smell? How do we how do we address that? And and you know that might be as simple as the things we've been talking about access to products and bags. But what are your tips as a, as an ostomate? Faisal, I'll start with you. What would your tips be on avoiding leaks and smell? I think the first thing is you need to know and understand your stoma. You need to know that your stoma is going to change shape. Um, your body changes shape, and as that happens, your your pouching system may need to change. When you are changing your bag, it is always a good idea to examine the base um, of, of the, the, the base plate to see if there's any sort of trail of the waste um, pushing through. And that may mean that you may need a paste or a different type of bag uh, to accommodate for this extra crease that may have formed on, 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 on the belly. Um, another common th reason that that can be happening is the bag is not cut big enough, uh, or, or sorry, too big. Um, you haven't sized it to the correct size of the stoma itself. So it needs to be a snug fit so that nothing can seep through underneath. Um, but if you are unsure, speak to your stoma nurse and they can help you. And this speaks to the lack of education that's happening when patients are being discharged. Yeah, I think you know we, we these, have we, we have to we have to say that leaks leaks aren't normal always, um, and we have to look at how we can address that. I was recently going through a, a phase of having quite a lot of leaks, and it was really getting quite distressing. And I've done one simple thing: I was changing my bag at night time, putting a fresh bag on, and then going to bed. And I was getting leaks in the night. And what I realized was by doing that, the bag wasn't getting enough time to kind of get stuck to so my skin and to form a good seal. And before I went to bed and I was lying flat and then it was leaking. So all I've done is switch my bag change to the morning. And now I'm not having leaks. And it was that mm. simple. So a very small tweak to your system can actually make all the difference. So. My advice would be to think about what's happening. When are you getting leaks? Why are they happening? Is it diet related? Is it the bag choice? Could you be using a different wipe or adhesive remover if, if you have access to those things, some kind of paste? Is it your body shape has changed? 
and to get support from a stoma nurse if you can. And all the associations will have will have associate will have relationships with nurses and can put you in touch with people as well. And with regards to smell, um, that's often when the filters aren't necessarily working that well on the bag. So just changing the bag maybe more frequently. Um, odor when you change the bag is probably unavoidable. Um, it is yeah. what it is. Uh, yeah. Jan, what's your what are your thoughts on that? Well, I basically approve what, with what you have all said. But uh, one thing is you need to clean your skin very carefully if you are changing the base plate. Don't leave any glue on it when you change the plates. I had problems with that for a while, but after I started cleaning my skin very thoroughly, those problems went away. And I also try to have a shower when I'm changing the base plate. That helps to clean the skin and it gives the skin some extra nourishment to have a little bit of water flowing on it. Yeah. So I think we have, yeah, and Heisel mentioned the, the paste that I was going to mention and then I think you have cleared those those issues were quite well. This, this was just what yeah. I was. <laughs> Go on, Faisal. I, I think the question around the smell, I, I think one of the things we got to remember, uh, you know, prior uh, uh, stoma surgery, uh, you'd go to the toilet, you do your business, it's all behind you. It's now in front. So when you're changing your bag, you are going to smell it more. Mm. It's a bit more and in your face, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's, a, it's right under your nose. And, yeah. And <laughs> that's, that's part of the acceptance, is accepting the fact that, you know what, I just do my number one or my number two, we do it a little differently than what we used to. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really, it's, if you think about it, um, without the emotion, mm -hmm. it's not the end of the world. <laughs> it is tough though. I mean, I've, I've gone into public toilets before and, and emptied my bag. And then I've heard someone go in after me and kind of gag or go, oh, this is awful. <laughs> and, and I'm like, oh my God, I've just gone away. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's not, it's, it's, it's not always pleasant, is it? And I do find that a bit difficult sometimes. Um, so I have taken to sort of using a little bit of an air freshener or something to, so I don't upset <laughs> the person right. who's going in after me. But it's it's not always fun. And my poor husband, bless him. But he's my husband's incredible. He just says, oh, I don't smell anything. I'm sure he's lying, but he's very supportive. Um, OK, so we've got a few more minutes just to work through a few more of the questions that have come through into the chat. Um, so completely different question. Um, what does a patient support group do and what would somebody get from going to one? So Jan, can I start with you? Well, if you, yeah, you should be expecting somebody to talk to that has been going through the things that you are going through right now. People with 20 years or so of experience to talk to people like that can be invaluable. Mm. Support groups are also perhaps representing you in, a, in cases against the health authorities to ensure that you are fairly treated in hospitals and healthcare, in the healthcare system. So yeah, that, that would be the basic rights. They also have, uh, they also have uh, information lectures, have doctors and nurses come and give lectures on something new or something important in the Ostomy world. That's, that's invaluable also to keep you informed. I think those three things would be some of the basic things that you can expect from a support group. Yeah, I, I've been along to a few support groups myself and given talks about <coughs> exercise and and Tonya, um, you know, risk reduction and, and all those things as well. And I think that's um, that's been, you know, really well received. Um, Faisal, what about you? You're, you're very heavily involved in support groups there in South Africa. So what could somebody expect from one of your groups and, and what, you know, what would they get from, from going to it? I, th I think one of the first things, and, and, and Jan mentioned it, is you are exposed to other ostomates. And as much as I said, we don't, you don't share medical advice, but we can share experience. And that experience allows us to learn from each other. Um, I'm learning weekly something new um, 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 from from our group. The other benefit with with a well-established um, 
uh, a support group is the relationship that they have with the various suppliers available in the country. So when we need to advocate, we can often get those suppliers involved to say that, listen, um, we need to do X, Y, and Z for, 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 for the patient. And they often offer that guide and support that is needed, uh, especially when it comes to getting the correct product. Um, but most important, it is a group of people who are going through the same challenges that you are, mm -hmm. and we're there to support each other. Yeah, I think it's that peer, it's, it's that mixture, isn't it, between having professional education talks and support, some kind of advocacy, someone to speak up for you if you need some help and, and to know where to direct mm -hmm. you to resources, but also that peer-to-peer -peer support, whilst not necessarily providing medical information, it's that peer-to-peer -peer support, which the, the empathy and understanding of someone else has gone through a similar situation, um, you know, it, it is really valuable. There's lots of valuable things. Um, what if people don't have a patient support group um, near them? How, how do they, um, how would they get that support? I spoke to a guy who was saying he's in Singapore and he, he didn't get any information. So he wrote to a UK association and they sent him some information in the post. I mean, what do we think about doing online groups or Zoom groups? And presumably that's happened. So, you know, if someone doesn't have a group, what could they do to access that support in a different way? Uh, Jan, I'll start with you. Well, online is, is, far, is far better than nothing. And many big mm -hmm. Ostomi associations, they have online helplines. You can call a phone number or, or get a Teams meeting with a person who, is, who has had Ostomi for many, many years mm -hmm. and knows all the problems that you are facing. You can also start by talking to close friends. That always helps. Uh, mm -hmm. Asking them what you what they think about your problems and how they could be solved. But yeah, online meetings and phone calls are, are, are also very useful if you don't have anything else. But I always prefer so, the person to person meeting. I think that is always better. Yeah. So reach out to your association in your country and see if they have a live in person group and if not if they're having something on on video. Um, and, and I've, I've personally found some some use in online social media groups. Um, you've got to be careful there. I think Faisal talked about that earlier and, and, and take information because there's a lot of negative and, and a lot of wrong information in some of those groups. But there's also a lot of positivity and a lot of um, support from some of those social media Facebook groups, for example. And I've, yeah. I know I, at the beginning, found that quite useful. Um, Faisal, what about you? So in South Africa, if somebody didn't have a local group for them, how would they get that support? So we registered SAS smack bang as the um, COVID pandemic hit South Africa and, and the country went into lockdown. And every meeting we've had since has been virtual. Um, and, and we've been seeing, we have uh, patients all the way from Cape Town, all the way up to, to, to Durban that logs on to that. So, they, you know, we, we're working towards that space where we can have the in-person meetings um, at the moment restrictions. But, you know, COVID has shown that it is possible to do it online. Um, and, mm. you know, if there's not one in your country, get in touch with the country closest to you um, and, 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 and start sharing, connecting that way. It's, it's important yeah. to know that you're not alone. I mean, the world th these days with Zoom, Teams, WhatsApp, um, are so much smaller. It, it's, we may not be in the same country, but we, we, we're just a phone call away. Yeah, and I think that's one of the, the, the benefits that's come out of the last 18 months is we've all realized that we can do so much more on video. And it actually, whilst it's not in person, it's better than nothing, and it still offers yeah. some level of support. So I think to reach out to wherever, and no one's going to turn you away from a Zoom call to come in as a chat, as an ostomate, whether you're in South... I might come to some of your groups in South Africa. They sound fun. Um, so we've got one minute left. Um, and I just want to sort of wrap up with Jan, really. Um, uh, there's a, a question come in saying, a lady's taking care of her, of her mother. Um, how does she help her with her rights? So. I'm not sure what problems they're having, but, but how would they access those rights? And if you could just finish that up, Jan, in 
40 seconds how she can how she can help her mother well she'll have to take the dialogue with the healthcare workers to start with and if that doesn't work she will have to take it further on there is always some sort of system that is supposed to take part, take care of all, all problems but uh, sometimes the system works and sometimes it doesn't but it all depends on you are you ready to fight for your rights that is the main issue here so to access that list the charter of ostomates rights from your website and just to start there with looking at what yeah. they are okay yeah. so i'm going to wrap up um so i'm just going to finish by i think that's pretty much it we've talked about a lot we could probably talk all day i think um thank you both very much for joining us today for this special world ostomy day and thank you everybody who's joined us and listened and i hope this has been useful and you have enjoyed this conversation um there are more sessions as the day goes through so please sign up for them by clicking the links in the chat box. You can access that by clicking on the chat button at the bottom of your screen. So finally, on behalf of Convitec, thank you to Jan and to Faisal for joining us. And please don't hesitate to get in touch with any of us. Just Google us, you'll find us online. Um, and also with Convitec if you need any support or further information. So thank you very much and happy World Ostomy Day. Thank you.